Thanks for listening to The Leader. We bring you the best news, analysis, commentary and interviews every day at 4pm. Subscribe to make sure you don't miss any. Now, from the Evening Standard in London, this is The Leader. Hi, I'm David Marsland. It's coming from the left, it's coming from the right. The BBC is under attack, but the Evening Standard says it mustn't go on the defensive. It's been a long time coming, arguably ever since the advent of Twitter and Facebook, because it's the problem that all the media is having to face as we get our news from so many places. Our comment editor, Susanna Butter, on why the BBC has to change. Also... He didn't do it to make money, he didn't do it to show off, he didn't really shout about this fantastic art collection. He did it because at the end of the day when he went home, he loved being surrounded by these pictures, these prints, these drawings. Our arts correspondent Robert Dex reveals the extraordinary story of our late film critic Alexander Walker and the art collection found in his flat that's now being exhibited at the British Museum. They found a Matisse beside the kitchen sink. Taken from the Evening Standard's editorial column, this is The Leader. For the whole thing, pick up the newspaper or head to standard.co.uk slash comment. In a moment, Britain is better off with the BBC than without it, but reform is essential. After days of abuse, the BBC's election anchor Hugh Edwards has fired back at critics of their coverage, taking aim at the laughable cluelessness of those accusing the corporation of bias. But the attacks aren't stopping and other moves are being made. The government appears to be boycotting Radio 4's Today programme and may be considering decriminalising not paying the licence fee. The Standard's reporting that the BBC is to expand broadcasts from outside London to convince viewers that it listens to the whole of Britain. Our editorial column says it's a good start, but there must be more to come. The BBC news outlets can help to bind our society together in a common and accepted account of the decisions that affect us rather than drive us apart, as many others do. So it is welcome to hear, as reported in this paper, a different, more emollient tone coming from the BBC's high command. They know they have to engage and change. Here are some pointers for the future. The flagship news programmes need to rethink their classic confrontational interview format, pioneered by the likes of Sir Robin Day and Jeremy Paxman. Entertaining as they can be, there's little to gain from a politician submitting themselves to that kind of treatment. The timing doesn't matter, that's what happened. Well, I've strengthened the processes in the last six but months. She posted that's why I the say Facebook that. on 2017, August. Yes. It's not that long ago. I've strengthened the processes since then. There also has to be a serious conversation about the licence fee. It relies on criminal sanctions which are likely to disappear in this parliament, not least because it is ridiculous that a huge proportion of all crimes that come before our magistrates' courts involve failure to pay the fee. Yes, it funds first-rate news gathering, but it also supports activities that are contributing to the decline of commercial news organisations in the UK. The instinctive reaction of the BBC will be to circle the wagons on all these suggestions. That would be a mistake. There's a new media territory out there, and a new political landscape too, and our national broadcaster has to find a way to occupy it. Our comments editor, Susanna Butters, here. Susanna... How has the BBC got itself into this situation? It's been a long time coming, I think. It's arguably ever since the advent of Twitter and Facebook because it's the problem that all the media is having to face as we get our news from so many places and everyone can have an opinion, which can be a good thing. And the BBC's tried to harness that. But in this election, it sort of became a focal point for a lot of hatred, both on the left and the right, which meant it's... Very hard to win, really. It is. And of course, this rise of social media has presented the BBC with another problem, particularly with programmes like the Today Show and, of course, the Andrew Neil interviews that Boris Johnson didn't do, in that politicians, because of social media, don't need them anymore. 
Absolutely. And people are saying sort of with the old fashioned Robin Day style of interviewing, which exists on today as well. Why would you go on it if you're just going to get a morning? If you look at Joe Swinson and Corbyn went on the Andrew Neil show and fine, they have their badge of I've done it like I've climbed a mountain. I've done my tough mudder, but they were mauled afterwards. And so you might say in many ways, kind of strategically, Boris Johnson made a clever move not going on it. And it says in our leader today that no Tory politicians have been on the Today Show since the election. So there's more ways for them to express themselves, whether they're releasing Love Actually style videos on their Twitter instead, they can control it. And that's something that's also happening in America, I guess, with Donald Trump. It's it's a new form of politics um, directly to the people. And in that, there should be a role for the BBC, because I think we do still need that impartial reporting. But if they're solution to all the voices is to be more combative that's clearly not not working so they need to have another look at their methods another area that could look at some reform is the license fee we understand that the government is perhaps looking at decriminalizing that that could be an interesting new era for the bbc couldn't it absolutely especially as it's already quite strained um across all strands. I mean, if you look at drama, it's in competition with Netflix, Apple TV. Um, They've got a tiny fraction of their budgets. And the licence fee is such a... I think a lot of people in the BBC have been taking that for granted. And if you get a new culture secretary who really puts that under scrutiny and cuts that down and looks at the kind of criminal aspects of that. BBC is going to have to urgently find new forms of revenue. And in an age when most people, they pay for Netflix, they might pay for Apple TV... um, Paying the licence fee on top of that might feel like a hit. Reform, if it happens, doesn't have to be damaging to the BBC. And I suppose one way they could start is by talking to and listening to their audiences. And by looking at what they do well. So they've got a lot more women presenters on news programmes this year, which has been fantastic and led the way across the board. The Emily Maitness Prince Andrew interview changed arguably the whole royal family Um, and that was partly down to tireless producers on Newsnight working really hard to get the right people on and frame it in a clever way and in drama we wouldn't have Fleabag if it wasn't for the BBC Um, Felicity Jones made her career in The Archers so if you look at the BBC broadly it's doing a lot right and by looking at its strengths it can address its weaknesses and move forward because it should be a really important institution and it's one that is envied across the world and can be agenda setting. Next. The cooker wasn't used, but it had paintings put up on it. And bookshelves had paintings propped up, but they were in the cupboard where he kept his vacuum cleaner. Robert Dex on Alexander Walker, the Standard's film critic who quietly collected a museum standard art collection that's now going on display. Alexander Walker was the Standard's film critic from 1960 to 2003, the year he died. He was much loved in this newsroom, fondly remembered as a colourful character who wrote best-selling books on Stanley Kubrick and Elizabeth Taylor. But few here knew he was also an art lover, building up an enormous collection. He stored them in his small flat in Maida Vale, where experts from the British Museum were astonished to find works by Picasso and Hockney hanging on walls and tucked away in cupboards. They're now staging an exhibition. And our arts correspondent, Robert Dex, is here to tell us more. Robert, how did this happen? How did it happen is a, is a long story. Um, Alexander Walker was this newspaper's film critic for about 40-odd years. He also quite liked art. And when he had some money, and he, he himself said he had fluctuating funds, was I think how he described it, he'd buy what he liked. And as, as the years went on, he bought more and more and more. Um, and, and it's worth saying, while he was doing all this, he was in a very small ground floor flat in Maida Vale. And if you ever see photos of this flat, every inch of the wall is covered in art, prints, drawings, paintings. Um, they're hanging above his bath. It doesn't look like he was a big entertainer at home, so the cooker wasn't used, but it had paintings put up on it. And um, bookshelves had paintings propped up, but they were in the cupboard where he kept his vacuum cleaner. He just bought and bought and bought and it seemed like every penny he had went on art and as you say in in the piece you wrote when he died all they found was the art and what was in the fridge five bottles of champagne <laughs> yeah i mean I mean pausing only briefly to think that you know we've got into journalism at the wrong time when a, a journalist passes away and what he leaves is five bottles of champagne and a picasso on the wall um but no i mean I, in his defense he was pretty frugal 
he bought prints that were, if you like, the cheapest way to buy very, very big names. Yeah, I think the most he spent was, I think it was £30,000, wasn't it? Yeah, 40000 US dollars, some point in the, the mid-90s. Um, there was a point, I think, where the books he wrote started to sell quite well and he had a little bit more money to play with. But again, he didn't go crazy. He still just bought prints of what he liked and what he knew. And I think that's probably what helped. And towards the end of his life, he used to go to the British Museum and talk to the experts there and they'd say, well, why are you interested? And he'd say, well, I've got some work at home. And they said, do you mind if we come and look at it? And they went back to his flat and looked at it and just said, you do realise you basically have a museum standard art collection here. Um, and I don't think he did realise, really. He was just buying what he liked when he could afford it. Um, but he did it so well and clearly had an eye for it that um, it was so good that when he died he, in his will, he left it to the museum. That must have been an extraordinary day for those people going round from the museum just to see... Because you can imagine walking in that door expecting, oh, he's probably got a couple of nice things here and there, and then just going, oh, what? <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, I, there was something, like, I think they opened the cupboard where he kept his vacuum cleaner, and that had several sort of major prints in it as well, because he just didn't have room to hang them anymore. Um, yeah, I mean, it's uh, long before my time, I didn't didn't know the man at all, but he was cl clearly quite remarkable. Um, he, he basically educated himself about art. He knew nothing about it when he started. This is a man who gave his opinion for a living, but when it came to art, he went and listened to the other people who knew more than he did and acted on it. And he, he bought what he liked, which is what everyone, if you ever ask anyone about collecting art, they'll always say, never buy with an aim to make a profit. He never sold any of the works he bought, even though he could have sold them for many, many times more than what he paid for them. He wanted things he loved to look at. So it must all make for a, a fascinating and really quite unique exhibition. Yeah, I mean, it's it's also because it's, it's it's one man's vision, so you can sort of see how his tastes change and he got interested in different things at different times. Um, and also you can just sort of, I think, knowing the story, even knowing a little bit about the story, what comes through is just his sheer love for it. He didn't do it to make money. He didn't do it to show off. He didn't really shout about this fantastic art collection. He did it because at the end of the day, when he went home, he loved being surrounded by these pictures, these prints, these drawings. And a bit of champagne. And a bit of champagne. And that's the leader. You can keep us in champagne and Picassos by subscribing through your podcast provider and give us a rating too. And why not try out our audio news bulletins through your smart speaker? Just ask for the news from the Evening Standard. The leader is back tomorrow at four. Mm -hmm.